A very warm welcome to you from Equa Marketing. This presentation is brought to you by Equa.com, a leader in digital marketing. Hello, everyone. I'm super, super excited today to have somebody I really, really look up to, Dan Sullivan, the co-founder of Strategic Coach. There are a few people in this world I admire a lot, and Gandhi and Steve Jobs and so forth. And the reason I, I guess I admire them is because they kind of saw the world differently, and more importantly, they were great teachers. We still talk about what Gandhi said about be the change you want to see in the world and what Steve Jobs talked about, let's leave a ding on the universe and change the world. So Dan is somebody that I first heard about by listening to one of his podcasts, and I'm like, wow, he can just summarize things in like one or two minute nuggets. That makes a ton of sense. So Dan, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Well, thank you very much, Naren. That's a real treat. I was very excited when you brought up the idea of doing the podcast. I love doing this, especially since you're in the 10 times program and we talk about how you multiply things by 10 times, but you want to multiply things by a million times. So <laughs> I don't know who should be most admiring today, you or me. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Actually, you are the one who actually got me to think about how do we grow a thousand times for the first time? Because at the end of the day, you kind of made me realize it's just a number. That's all it is. It's nothing more than that. And I know you have coached, what, 18,000 entrepreneurs? I mean, you and Strategic Coach. We just crossed 18,000, and the starting point for that was 1989, November of 1989. I've coached about 6,000, and then I have 15 other coaches. But we know who the first one was, and we knew who number 18,000 was. So that just happened. That's awesome. And I think what makes you tick, at least in my mind, is you kind of simplify things for us. Mm -hmm. You kind of see things differently, and then you kind of give it to us in one page or three minutes. Or you have, you're famous for your books, right? Those quarterly books you put out? Yeah, I have a book, uh, I think, in 25-year frameworks. So when I was 70, I just completed a 25-year framework that had started when I was age 45, and now I was 70, so this is three years ago as we're talking here today. And I just said, okay, let's take it to 95, and what do I want to achieve over that 25-year period? And I said, you know what would be neat? I talked to a team, and we have great teams here at Strategic Coach, especially the production team. We can turn out really, really high-quality printed material, audio material, video material, but I was talking to the print team. And I said, I'd like to produce a book a quarter, every quarter, so 100 quarters over the next 25 years. And the first quarter was really scary because we didn't have the teamwork together to actually do that. But within about three quarters, we had created a unique process. We had created a unique teamwork to do that. And so right now, I'm just completing my 11th book, and this is the 11th quarter. It's taking me about maybe one-fifth the amount of time to actually do my part of printing the book, but I've added team members who do other parts of the book. They're great books because you can read them in an hour, and there's a rule in the book world that if you want somebody to read your entire book, make sure you keep it under 60 pages. Once it gets above 60 pages, it drops off fast. By the time you get to 100 pages, maybe 20% of the readers will read the whole book. If it gets to 200 pages, you're down to maybe 1% or 2%. I think probably 1% and the other 1% are liars. <laughs> they said they read the whole book, but they didn't. You bring up the idea of simplicity. And part of the reason why I'm passionate about simplicity is because I think complexity is the problem for everybody living in today's world, especially for the entrepreneurs that I coach like yourself. Right. One thing that really stuck me is you made a conscious choice, right? Which is you decided to be a hero to entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and not to anybody else. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me more about A, why did you make that choice? And B, what's the outcome of that choice you made? Well, you know, I've been around, let's call it the transformation world for a long time. Starting in the 1970s, there was kind of a thought in the world about transforming the world. I think it has a lot to do with the appearance of certain technologies 
where you could change things really fast, and those technologies are based on the microchip. So I've been there before this all started, you know, my childhood years and my teenage years. I wasn't involved in that world. It was mainly industrial manufacturing world. And then all of a sudden with the invention of the microchip and the microchip application to computers, personal computers, right up to the Internet where we are right now, what people notice, you know, it's possible for individuals who just have a big idea if they can get the right tools and the right team members behind them, they can really transform the world. What I noticed this conversation was that there was a part of the conversation that didn't interest me at all, and it had to do with saving the world. I don't like the world saving because the most part of the world that I can actually save is just myself and become a better person. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like a full-time job. And so I don't have a lot of time left over for going out and saving the world, you know, doing something in the world. But what I noticed that there was a certain type of individual of all the people I had coached, and I started coaching as my prime activity in 1974, I had worked with people who were CEOs of corporations. I had worked with elected politicians. I had worked with bureaucrats in government. I had worked with bureaucrats in corporations. I had worked with bureaucrats in nonprofit organizations. Just a lot of different people. And it was about a 10 year period where I had just experimented. But the one type of person who responded best to my coaching direction and the ideas I had about this all owned their own businesses. They were entrepreneurs. So the reason why I want to be a hero to these people is because I don't have an interest in being a hero to anyone else, but I want to be a hero. And what I mean by being a hero is that I would see them as very talented, successful individuals and they have big dreams, but the way they think about things, it's kind of complicated. Their heads are filled up with all sorts of complexity. And I said, you know, the way I can be a hero to this type of individual, I can't make them more intelligent. I can't make them more creative. I can't make them more talented. But what I can do is make their life more simple. And I don't mean that I'm going to go and make their life more simple. I'm going to help them make their thinking more simple. And as a result of making simple, they get greater access to their intelligence and talent and their ambition, and then they take a jump. They just speed ahead. All I've done is shown them that where they're looking at things, it's this complicated, it's this confusing, and we can bring it down to a much simpler idea, kind of a concept, or there's a process for thinking that bypasses a lot of the complexity, and then they take a jump. They rearrange their thinking about their life and their future, and then they come back for more simplicity. So my job every 90 days is to come up with something new that simplifies some part of their thinking. Right. And I really love this idea because it really gave me a lot of clarity in what I do. As a serial entrepreneur who tries to do different things, I realize that every business needs to be a hero to somebody mm -hmm. because that focuses the entire team, that focuses the clients. Can you talk a little bit more about what if you don't choose to be a hero to somebody and you are just a regular business? What are the downsides of just being a regular business versus making a conscious choice that I'm going to be a hero to a certain group of people? First of all, hero is a word that's kind of gone out of style. I was born during the Second World War, right before the Normandy invasion, so that from the standpoint of the United States and Great Britain and Canada, Normandy was a huge historical event, along with what the Russians were doing on the Eastern Front, but that landing in France of the troops, and then they eventually, within a year, the war was ended once they got there. That was a huge thing. So I was born in 44 and then got to talking age around 1950. And in our part of Ohio, where I grew up, there were people who had returned from the war. They were seen as real heroes. And they still seen as heroes. It wasn't just a passing phase that the people who took part in the Second World War who were 
actually in frontline troops and that they were really heroic individuals. Many of them died as a result of that. So I kind of grew up in this atmosphere in the 1950s where these soldiers and then there were other people, there were sports stars and everything else, and these were kind of presented as heroes to me. So I got this in my bloodstream <laughs> very, very early, and for some reason I've never lost this. Is that the whole point of leading a life that you're proud of and leading a life that gives you a great deal of enjoyment? you got to be a hero to someone else. What I mean by hero is they're confused and you give them direction, One of the things I communicate to people is that they're not alone with what they're striving to do. But the other aspect of why I've chosen entrepreneurs to be a hero is that once they realize that the greatest enjoyment they get out of starting a business, growing a business, having a very successful business in the marketplace is that they are actually being a hero to someone else. And if they don't get in touch with how they're being a hero to someone else, then they become commoditized in the marketplace because they just have a product or a service, and many other people have a product or a service. And you mentioned Steve Jobs when we first came along because if you look back over the last 40 years of the development of computerization and then everything that goes with it, I think he stands out as the number one hero. Bill Gates was far more successful than Steve Jobs, far wealthier today. But when I watch Bill Gates being interviewed now, he doesn't come across as a hero. He comes across as kind of a wonk. You know, he's kind of wonky and he's kind of an intellectual and he's very dry. And I never get the sense that Bill Gates was trying to be a hero to anybody. And then there's lots of other people who have come along in the high-tech world especially, and they're inventing new things. But I don't get a sense that they really think in terms that the work that we're doing is freeing individuals up and it's making their life more successful and more enjoyable. They're always talking in technological terms or they're talking in big mass changes on the planet, but I never feel the personal connection. And when you talk about hero... You're a hero to a somebody. You know, I want to be a hero to you. I think one of the reasons that we're having this podcast right now is because I think I've kind of gotten that message across. I want to run ahead of you, Naren, and anywhere where your life's complicated, I want to see if I can think through and present you with ways of thinking that simplify things and that make things easier, make things faster and more enjoyable for you. Day in, day out, I think about this. I always think in terms of individuals. I don't think in terms of masses of people. And it's the people I know. I'm surrounded in my life by either people who are entrepreneurs themselves or they're my team members in my company who are also being heroes to our clients in Strategic Coach. Right. One of the things I noticed is that when you try to be a hero to somebody, it makes you focus. It makes you really get in touch with your purpose. Like, for example, Steve Jobs wanted to be a hero to the average consumer who didn't know how to use technology. He just wanted the technology to be the servant, right? And you try to be a hero to people like me who are very creative, but sometimes we trip over ourselves because we don't have simple ways of looking at things. And I find that focus to be very exhilarating and very rewarding because the benefits you get is not just money. It helps you improve on purpose. It improves the relationships. I mean, like you and I have a relationship. It's not just about, you know, the check that I sign. It's really as somebody I look up to, you inspire me and you guide me and you make me think big and all those things, right? So it's relationships, it's purpose, it's time, it's money. All those things start kind of rearranging themselves when you try to be a hero to somebody. Mm -hmm. The proof is whether you are or not, you know, I can try to be a hero, And I've had lots of people that I, even though it was my purpose to be a hero, it didn't land. (laughs) It didn't have the impact. And you got to be truthful about that and not blame the other person for that and saying, what wasn't I understanding about where this person was going to be? So if you compare 1974, when I started coaching and now more than 40 years later, I think my listening for what's actually going on in the life of the 
other person is a lot better. So I don't start with a preconceived notion of what I'm going to do for the person because I'm going to ask a lot of questions first before I'm going to provide anything that's of value for the person. But having said that, I'm discovering that my greatest way that I actually be a hero is asking questions that the person, for the first time they've had that question, all of a sudden to answer the question, they have to redesign their thinking. And that I asked a question that powerfully allowed them to transform their thinking is the way that I'm actually a hero. I don't know if you've noticed, but strategic coach is nothing but questions. We have a way of putting your answers together in a system, and all of a sudden you have a breakthrough. But I would say, you know, if I have 60 people in a workshop, by the end of the day, I don't know what the breakthroughs are. I've just asked questions, but I can tell from the energy that the questions have opened new doors. They've indicated new directions for people. So that's really my sign that I'm being successful and being a hero. That's amazing. One of the other ideas that I got from you and that kind of made me realize is you changed the way I think about success. I mean, a lot of people think about success in terms of money. There came a point where I felt like whatever goal I want to achieve money-wise, I've achieved now what, right? And uh, you kind of let me rethink success in terms of purpose at the top, relationships, then time, then money. So almost like money is kind of at the bottom, you know, it kind of mm -hmm. flips. Can you talk more about these four things and why did you define these four things as, I mean, we all are trying to yeah. pursue happiness. Yeah, I think that the motivation, so as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, is that I've coached a lot of entrepreneurs. I think it's 6,000 and counting where I was the coach for the individual entrepreneur. I've also been conscious of how the world talks about entrepreneurs. You know, it shows up in movies, it shows up in all sorts of stories out there. And generally, the world has an easy answer of why entrepreneurs do what they do, and it's the money. And the reason is that they pick out extraordinary successes, whether it's Jeff Bezos at Amazon or Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook or Larry Page and Serge Berenier at Google and other really, really superstars. First of all, they have no notion what motivates these people, but they see enormous amounts of money and they said, well, it must be for the money. But actually, the really interesting entrepreneurs, and again, Steve Jobs, I never got the sense that Steve Jobs was about the money. It was about putting new things together. And he actually said it, you know, this was the mission statement for Apple while Steve Jobs was there. I don't know if it's still true. But his mission statement is that we make beautiful technology that people love using. And I said, boy, that's nice and succinct, you know, a neat little statement. Notice he didn't say we make beautiful computers that people love using. He said we make beautiful technology. Computers was just how he got into the game. But very, very quickly, I mean, the big impact of Apple in the world right now is the iPhone but it's all tied into an ecosystem that consists of the Apple operating system and connection to the internet. And they're the most highly valued company in the world, has been for quite a number of years now. But I never got the sense from Steve Jobs that it was really about money. I think he had a driving purpose of being useful in a uniquely new ways. And he didn't even invent new technology because almost everything that Apple came out was a significant improvement on something that already existed. But he had a way of linking all of his useful technologies together in a single system. Here at Coach, we've been Apple users for 30 years. People say, well, don't you have Windows? And I says, we don't go there. <laughs> you know, it's almost like a religion. But I think what we were doing is that we were picking up on the spirit of the real innovator. He wasn't a technologist. He wasn't a programmer. He didn't have any particular technological skills. But he had a vision of what these new technologies could actually do to help people. So I think he had a passion there to create things that were uniquely useful and as you indicated, it was for everybody. But I think he had a special love for people who were in the creative industries, artists and 
people who could do things. So Apple has always been associated with the artists and with the filmmakers and with the music makers. My own take on this, very definitely it's not about the money because for me it's not about the money. You need money, so my definition of having money is really that whatever I wanted to do as my next growth jump, the money would be there to pay for it. So my goal isn't money. My goal is enough money, always enough money. And to do that, you have to continue to create value. So my real reading on what motivates entrepreneurs is freedom, that why someone would go through the very difficult early stages of going into the marketplace on their own, and you have to do it on your own for a few years anyway. You have to go out there and to not ask someone else to guarantee your income, not to ask someone else to guarantee that you'll have certain benefits, not someone else to guarantee that you have a job, but simply to go out there and say, I relieve everybody else of taking care of my security and my financial success, and I'm going to take on this responsibility 100%. takes a lot of courage. I think it's kind of a heroic act myself. But you do it for freedom. The reason why I became an entrepreneur and I think it's probably your case also, Naren, is that we don't operate well taking orders in someone else's system. I just never did. It wasn't so much about other people's systems as I had my notion of my own system, and I thought I was smart enough and I thought I was courageous enough that I could go out and I could make my way of thinking about the world and organizing the world that I could go out and I could make enough money that I could support myself to do it. And it was tough. I mean, I have to tell you, the first 10 years were really, really tough. I'm going through an orthopedic procedure right now, and I was talking to the doctor. I had to list previous orthopedic surgeries I had, and the most significant ones, and there were three major ones in the 19... 70s. He said, boy, the 1970s was a really tough decade for you. What was going on there? (laughs) The 1970s were six of the years of my start of my entrepreneurial career, and I didn't talk to him about the two bankruptcies and the divorce either. But it was tough. I mean, it was really tough. But I stuck with it because there was no going back. So the first thing was a freedom. And the first freedom, you mentioned that I have four things that I use as my standards, and the first one is freedom of time. I wanted my time. I didn't want someone else to own my time. And then with owning my time, I had to have freedom over money, making money in the way that really lined up with how I wanted to use the time. And as it turned out, coaching is really a ideal activity for me because I'm very good at asking questions and listening to the answers and then asking further questions about the answers so that the person can see their thinking outside of themselves. And once they can see their thinking outside of themselves, then they can make all sorts of decisions and judgments that they can't do if it's just thoughts roaming around in their brain. So freedom of time, freedom of money, and then working with who I want to work with, and that includes who the team is inside of Strategic Coach, and then who are the entrepreneurs who are coming to the Strategic Coach workshops. So once you have the time, the money, and the relationship, and you have freedom there, the purpose really develops. How I express the purpose right now is I want to create game changers. I want to help people simplify their life so much that the company they have is a self-managing company so they don't have to spend much time managing. And then it becomes a self-multiplying company and it's a company that makes money when the entrepreneurs are on free days. And then the third jump there is they are so well organized and they are so simple in their thinking and all their attention can be outside that they can pick certain people out in the marketplace and create game-changing breakthroughs and solutions for them. So that's my purpose, to spend the rest of my life finding fantastic entrepreneurs who are game-changers. In other words, some part of life, they do something for people, which is kind of similar to what I do for people. They simplify people's lives. Things happen easier, things happen faster, and they get bigger results. So that's my purpose right now. And in my 70s, I now know 
probably the dominant purpose is for the rest of my life. And it gets more and more refined, right? It's not just entrepreneurs anymore. It's game-changing entrepreneurs. Game-changing entrepreneurs, yeah. yeah. And a game-changer is very different from a lot of entrepreneurs. The game-changer is operating on a passion that comes from the inside. A lot of entrepreneurs say, well, I want to see where the big opportunities are, and I'll go out there, and I'll... They're money makers, but they don't necessarily have a passion for the thing they're doing. The other thing is that game changers start with people and work backwards. In other words, they look at a particular, like I worked at entrepreneurs, those were the people. So it's not the entire planet. It's not the entire global population. I'm just picking on this one group, first of all, because there's room for thousands and millions of game changers, and everybody's going to pick something that they have a passion for, and this is the one that I have a passion for. And the other thing is that I give myself permission. So I have three Ps. I have passion, people, and permission. A lot of entrepreneurs, as we've developed, we've had to ask permission, can we do this? And we've had to ask permission. You have to constantly give yourself permission to take the next step. But if someone else is encouraging you, to give that permission. So I'm really great at giving people permission. When they come in with an idea, I don't say, well, I don't think that's a good idea. I think, you know, you got a really good income stream going. I think you ought to stay with this for the rest of your life. Kind of work on your personal life, get a good house, you know, get your kids in the right school. And I said, well, you won't hear that from me. I just want to know about your idea. And I says, well, I give you permission to work on this idea. And sometimes people kind of have the idea. They're kind of committed to the idea, but when they spend an hour with me, at the end of the hour, they say, I have 100% permission to work on this idea. And I, I think that's a unique ability on my part, that anybody who wants to do anything where I can see the real value in terms of being a game changer, I give you 100% permission, and I'll support you in any way I can, and I'll link you up with other entrepreneurs who are doing things which you can learn from and they can learn from you. So I'm a great person to come to for permission if you're a game-changing entrepreneur. Absolutely. You gave me permission to do lots of things. You know, for example, one of the things you talked about is free days, buffer days, and focus days. And I felt guilty of taking time off. I felt guilty of not being busy. Mm -hmm. And I'm still struggling with this, but I've come, I think, a long way compared to where I used to be a couple of years ago when I first... Oh, you seem kind of relaxed and laid back today, so you must have been treating yourself right before you came in here. I was a workaholic. First of all, I should come clean on this. What we call a free day in Strategic Coach is 24 hours, midnight to midnight, when you don't do anything related to your work. Okay, A lot of entrepreneurs, if they told the truth, they can't remember a day in their life when they didn't think about their work. But I've developed all sorts of interests, like I'm a big history buff, and I'm very, very interested in the impact of microtechnology on politics and on culture. You know, and this doesn't have anything to do with my work because I don't bring any of this knowledge necessarily back, but it's just understanding the world and how it has changed since I was a child in the 1940s and 1950s. You know, I'm very fresh with it. I don't think the old days were better than the new days. It's just there's lots of changes, very interesting changes. So I do that, and then I read murder mysteries. I love murder mysteries, international thrillers, you know, terrorism plots and everything like that. I'll be going to our cottage up north in Ontario, about three hours north of Toronto on Thursday, and I'll be there for seven days, and I'll read seven books. I'll spend five, six hours a day reading murder mysteries. And then I don't see this as you could have been spending that time working on your company. Why are you doing that? And I said, I've got a great company. I have a self-managing company that is now a self-multiplying company, and it's becoming a game changer. And it's precisely because I've taken lots of free time. So when I am working, I've tried to organize my time in such a way that I have whole days that just are about new things that are going to make a greater impact, are going to be more useful for entrepreneurs, and they're going to make us more money. And then I have a third day, and that's a 24-hour day too, midnight to midnight. 
And then the third day is a buffer day. And a buffer day, one of my favorite buffer days is I don't have anything on the schedule and I just come in. I don't have an office. I haven't had an office for 25 years because if it's my office, it's all filled up with junk and it's not neat and it's sloppy. So I tried for years and years to be neat about my office and I just gave up the fight. So I said, let's just not have an office So we have a big cafe in our company in Toronto and also in Chicago, and I just have a table and a chair in the cafe. I can do my work there, and everybody filters through the cafe all day. They get lunch. They get breakfast. They're getting coffee. They're having little meetings and everything else, and I feel really, really connected. But on a buffer day, I'll just sit there, and maybe I'll talk to 15 people you know, sit down on what's going on. And this is a way that I stay in contact with all the interesting things that our self-managing company is doing and self-multiplying company is doing. So those are buffer days. And sometimes it's, I don't have a lot of stuff in my life. I lead a very simple life. I essentially only do three things. What I'm doing right now is one of the three. This is a form of marketing, you know, you're going to introduce me to all sorts of people that I wouldn't meet otherwise. So it's marketing. And then we'll take your words here on the podcast and we'll send them out to all the strategic coach clients. So all of our people will learn out what you're doing. If you say anything, you know, so far you've just asked questions, but this might be a good time for you to talk about your passion and your people that you're being a hero to and what you're giving yourself permission to do. How old are you now? You're. I'm 41, Dan. 41, yeah. You don't look 41. But, you know, you got a huge life ahead, which is a lot bigger than the life you've lived. It's fascinating. So you said I gave you permission regarding your time, so tell me what you're doing with your time now. Yes, Dan. So three years ago, I felt like, now what, right? Like you get to a point, all these things you wanted, you accomplish it, and now what? And I realized it took me a while, and discovering you was part of what got me to the answer, is is that I love, and you talk about unique ability, I love to create new things, see the world differently, give people courage, confidence, and clarity. Three words I, again, picked up from you. And again, you taught me that I don't need to justify why I want what I want. I can wish for anything I want, and I don't need to tell somebody, oh, this is why I need it, I want it. Oh, I just want it, that's it. What I want to do and what I want to dedicate the next 30 years, and you also taught me to think long term, I want to figure out how to grow 1,000 times. The impact, not the money, not just the impact. Because my belief is if you are adding 1,000 times more value to others, your life is going to be better in terms of relationships, purpose, time, and money. I mean, those are byproducts of your dream. And that has fascinated me over the last three years. So I like to experiment. I'm not somebody who kind of tells somebody to do it and then not try it myself. So I built a product called fanschoice.org, which is the idea that businesses need fans. And we have grown 100 times in two, two and a half years. So that fascinates me a lot. And again, why am I doing it? Just because I want to, you know, just there's no reasons, there's no justification. And create a bunch of other things like video capability is something that we are really getting good at because the world, the way it's moving, these short one or two minute videos are game changers. The podcast we are having today would be converted into videos and spread through social media and all that stuff. So one hour of your time is amplified a thousand times through all these different things. So I'm working on all these different game changing things and we created this whole set of products again inspired by you because I saw your podcast. I'm like, I can do it too. So that was six months ago and we have 40 episodes and now you're my guest. So that's awesome. So you have confidence in me to say, you know, I need to give Narayan an hour of my time. So that's growing, and we have like growing dentists. Because marketing, in my mind, is really simple. It's getting more people to know you, because if they don't know you, they can't like you. And once they know you, getting them to like you. And once they like you, getting them to trust you. So it's a way of doing that, not one-on-one, but in front of hundreds or thousands of people. And I have met people who tell me they know me, but I have never met them. It's because they saw my video, or they heard me on somewhere, and they feel like they know me, and... I mean, you know, presidential politics and all these things you watch. I mean, the president is not shaking 10 million people's hands, but 10 million people feel like they know him and they like him and they trust him and they vote for him and they tell their friends to vote for him, right? 
so I'm fascinated by these things about how humans think and how they work and how do you merge technology with a lot of these human needs and human ways of doing things. I mean, we are kind of like machines. If I'm nice to you, it's very hard for you to be rude to me. So almost like Cialdini talks about that, right, liking. I'm fascinated by these things, so I hope I gave you a long-winded mm-hmm. answer. It was almost like the first 38 years, uh, if you're giving me your age correctly. So 38, it was almost like stage one, and now you're into stage two. And I think it's good to think about your life where you can sort of sum up everything you've done up until the present, and then you can go back and you say, what were the most important things I learned from stage one? But then stage one, all that learning now just becomes raw material for creating stage two. And it seems to me that you had a lot of experience You seem to be a real thinker. You like the whole thing about thinking, but you're much clearer right now about what you can do. And I like the way you're thinking about creating networks and communities and feeding them constant, encouraging information, constant lessons that are useful lessons. In a certain way, you're exactly what I am. You're a coach. You're kind of a coach. And I think coaching is the dominant form of human progress in the 21st century. I think management was the dominant form of human progress in the 20th century. I don't know if people like being managed. If you just want to be told what to do and you don't want to contribute anything besides your ability within an organized structure, then maybe you need management to keep going. But entrepreneurs don't want to be managed. They want to be coached so that They're kind of taking the direction and the insight that the coach has given them, but they want to custom design it for their own path ahead. This is the biggest explosion of entrepreneurial thinking that's taking place right now, and it's not very old. People say, well, you know, there were always entrepreneurs. There were always entrepreneurs in human history, but they were never heroes to the general public. And that only starts about 200 years ago, actually, you know, around late 1700s, 1800. Up until that time, warriors were heroes and religious prophets were heroes and kings were heroes and aristocrats were heroes. This person who went out into the marketplace and created something new that made things better, they weren't heroes until basically the late 1700s. And it started in Holland, the birthplace of entrepreneurism, was Holland, but right at that time they were involved in a trade war with England, and England won. So all the really ambitious Dutch came across. They actually, one of their kings took over England, and they brought the stock market across with them. They brought the futures market across with them, and they brought the entire economic system. It was kind of like a reverse takeover of all the best entrepreneurs in Holland, and they came over to Britain, and then it really took off with the British because the British always had really good legal systems. Probably the best, the finest legal systems in the world were established by the British, and you can look around the world right now. Two of our team members were just in New Delhi, and they said how easy it was to operate in India simply because there's more people who have English as their first language in India than any other country in the world. I think it's like 360 million. Far more people speak English, but it's... 360 million have it as their first language. But anywhere you go around the planet and you see where the British were, they have good legal systems. And legal systems are very, very necessary for entrepreneurism to thrive because if you've created something, you have to have ownership guaranteed. So the property laws in the English-speaking world that came from Great Britain are really the best. So I think It was an admiration for entrepreneurs, and then you had a technology, which was steam power, which really created the first multiplier possibilities, where you weren't depending on animal power or human power or water power, but you really, really had an ability to create uh, multiples of productivity. So that coincided with entrepreneurs becoming heroes to the general society, and now the U.S. is probably the most advanced entrepreneurial country in the world, but again, it's based on a heritage that they 
got from Great Britain. So this is probably the first time in human history where a person like yourself, a person like myself, can just watch your way into the future. We don't need our way into the future. I think you did it at a much younger age than I did, but people say, well, why do you need to do this? And I say, well, I don't need to do any of this. I just want to do it. The money's there, the time's there, the relationships are there, the purpose is there. I feel enormously grateful that I was born when I was born and have good health. You know, I was born with a good brain, so that all these things are really useful. But roll of the dice, my dice came up good. <laughs> you know, speaking of coaching, I do agree with you. Like, we don't have any managers. It's all coaches. And the reason is, I think, everybody has something their best in the world that they love to do. And you talk about unique ability. I know we need to wrap up. But can you just close up by talking a little bit about unique ability, Dan? Yeah, and this is, I think, self-observation first. I spent an enormous amount of time alone as a child. Not unhappy. I was a very, very happy child. But from the earliest age, I taught myself how to entertain myself, for one thing. So nobody needed to entertain me. And the second thing was nobody really needed to educate me. I learned how to educate myself very, very early. What I noticed pretty early is that nothing that existed in the world was designed for me. Like, I grew up Catholic, and, you know, I got really, really clear that the religion wasn't created for me. I mean, it was created for a lot of good reasons, but it was mostly so that collective values and that could be passed on generation after generation. School, when I went to school, it wasn't designed for me. I don't know where I got the thought, and I think it came from my mother. She said, you know, reading is more important than going to school. She said, if you can read, you can go anywhere you want with your brain, and you don't have to ask anybody's permission. That was like permission. And I just began to see a difference between what I needed to develop myself and what was provided already, packaged by other people. Some of it was useful, some of it wasn't useful, but I didn't rebel against anyone else's system. And I would look at in other systems, whether it was religion, whether it was the family, whether it was the town where I grew up in, the school I went to, there were parts of it that were useful, but it was useful according to my say. In other words, I'll take this and I'll use it. Looking back, that was kind of an entrepreneurial activity. And what I noticed is that I had certain abilities which I could work on, which gave me a lot of energy, gave me a lot of excitement. And over the years, I mean, I'm talking about kind of like a 50-year progression here, I just came up with a name for this, is that everybody has something in the center of what makes them tick that is unique. Nobody else on the planet is like that. And if they really take it seriously and they really make it practical. In other words, you can have a unique ability, but it's not practical. In other words, you can't use it to make money. You can't use it to actually achieve. One of it was that I was just really, really good at listening to people, asking them questions, open-ended questions, not like I had the answer, but I would just ask them a question about what they had said, and they would get very, very excited about it. And then as I went into the marketplace with this, then I found out that I could make a very good living doing this. And I could teach other people how to do it, and they could make a very good living too. So that's a unique ability. So I simply took the model that I had developed for myself, and I said, I wonder if this is true for other people. And what I noticed, and this goes back to an earlier question you asked, why just entrepreneurs? Entrepreneurs are the number one people on the planet who give themselves permission to just make a business model out of what's unique about them. In other words, they don't try to fit into somebody else's model. They actually create their own model. The only thing that they have to do to really free themselves up from that model is stop blaming other people for not understanding them and for not supporting them and just give forgiveness to the rest of the world. Look, it wasn't your responsibility to take my uniqueness and develop it. It's my responsibility to take my uniqueness. So we've based our entire strategic coach program on just finding what that thing is. And we have a very systematic way of going about it. 
we have a whole system and everybody quarter by quarter when they're in strategic coach get clearer unless they don't give themselves permission. And I go back to this. Some people, it's too scary to give themselves permission to just operate uniquely in the world. But once you have unique ability, then you can create unique ability teamwork with other people. So I have permission just to work on my uniqueness, but everybody who works around me has permission to work on their uniqueness. And then we do teamwork, and that can scale. That can just get bigger and bigger. I'm at the stage now where I'm giving people permission to use their unique ability to be a game changer in the world, and then to link up their game changing uniqueness with other game changers. From a basically a lone farm boy in the 1950s to really having some major players that I'm working with. And I just see it developing into the future. But the essential starting point for everything we do in Strategic Coach is to give yourself this permission to really take seriously the thing that you're really unique at. Nobody else in the world has this uniqueness. And then permission to make it very, very practical in the business world. Okay, and the more you do that, the more you will attract other people who want to do the same thing. So it's very simple at the center. It's not real complicated, but it does require a lot of courage. It does require work, and it requires communication. It requires cooperation, and it costs a lot of money, but the money's always there. Thank you, Dan. I had a wonderful time. I know we have a hard stop, so uh, thank you very much for your time today, and I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to all of our listeners about how to grow as an entrepreneur and how to create a bigger future. Thank you, Nair.